<laughs> hey guys, so some of you are aware of the fact that I was writing a book about Beelzebub, and I was originally writing it with somebody else. But I went ahead and published my portions of the book independently, so they're actually available now under the title Armada's Book of Beelzebub. I can provide a link in the description. This first edition is ultimately going to become rare. So, it's exploring Beelzebub, Beelzebub's presence in archaic occult literature. It includes some summonings and spells from the manuscripts preserved in state libraries, including a spell from a book which was confiscated during the actual Inquisition. It's kind of hard, like, because I can't move the book around because I have this, like, thing holding my camera directly where it is. Um, so it's not really, I can't really show you a lot in this video. It's mostly just me talking. Yeah, there are numerous spells in here um, that incorporate Beelzebub from practitioners' handbooks from hundreds and hundreds of years ago. The histories which I write for these books in some places will contradict what other authors have written. For example, Michelle Belanger has printed incorrect information that I have rebutted, and my corrections can be proven by reading over trial records or even speaking to the greats with expertise on this content. I know of no one else who has officially made these corrections in print. In other instances, I merely reported small overlooked details which, if exposed, could impact one's opinions. For example, Rankine, who published the 2011 edition of the Grimoire of Author Gauntlet. Um, Rankine wrote that William Lilly, uh, 1602 to 1681, provided some significant peripheral information when he called Author Gauntlet a very lewd fellow. Rankine also wrote, it seems curious that Lilly can be negative about Gauntlet. Lilly's single reference to him as a lewd fellow stands out and labels Gauntlet without allowing any opportunity for defense of his character or further consideration. But I was able to find something further to consider. Rankine is correct. This was Lily's single reference to him as a lewd fellow, but it wasn't Lily's single reference using that same phrasing, lewd fellow. I write, and this is from the book. It is important to note that Lily's autobiography is packed with his meeting related persons, and he had no qualms about scorning those who, in his assessment, were deluding the masses, even going so far as to refer to one perceived fraud as being a pretending ignoramus. By comparison, his commentary on Gauntlet's spe speculatrix is definitively high praise. And while considerable emphasis has been placed on Lily's regard for Gauntlet as being a lewd fellow, he frequently used the adjective lewd throughout his personal narrations. In one example, while writing about a man called Windor, Lily declared that he had many good parts, but was a most lewd fellow. This description, therefore, is not necessarily the dismissive defamation it was taken for. It just seems that he had no affection for Gauntlet. Absolutely, we should still consider the kind of man who would have such a talented speculatrix at his employ. I was careful not to be swept away with those who regurgitate misinformation. Great care went into this, all of it. An excerpt from within cautions the bibliophile, and this is another quote from the book. Be wary of those who, in their eagerness to publish, feel the need to fill up the blank spaces with falsified wisdom to keep up with a quota. We must be willing to admit when we do not have the answers, and you, the reader, must yourself be wise. Be not taken by the glittering fools and liars. Sometimes there is more value in a person who says, I do not know than a blow-up doll preaching arbitrary and made-up insights, especially when to do so causes inquiring minds to stop in their tracks, satisfied by the deceit. Remember that the occult itself is full of tests and booby traps that will catch you at the door. These idols and idol authors who so appeal to the masses are there to distract them. Another relevant quote from the book. Given that there exists occult literature boasting an earlier period or origins which are otherwise debunked, the task of writing about those who have written before us is actually a momentous challenge. We must, whenever possible, verify the sources, for fear of later embarrassment. The concern for this is a good one, however, as to respect it and perform our due diligence will ultimately elevate the quality of our own insight. So, I cannot express enough, even though um, this book may be about Beelzebub's presence in old texts, if you're a fan of Dontalian, he's in it too. I found some stuff that might surprise you from the early 17th century, prior to the Key of Solomon, the Universal Treatise family of manuscripts. I discuss as well the first known publication of the Book of the Office of Spirits, which preserves some of the pieces Wire had sought to suppress. Could these be a possible link to Dontalian's origins? If so, he is a much bigger player than most people have imagined. Were you privy to Dontalian's former status as a prince, preceding his goetic ranking of duke? Yes, for numerous manuscripts from hundreds and hundreds of years past. It was Prince Dontalian. And there's more. My book will sing, Dontalian appeared in demonology before Wire. And somehow the spirit managed to find his way back to us, under the guise of many names, as would befit our charming Duke of Faces. Religious historians and students of medieval literature have long since been concerned with the possibility that certain texts were foremost carried by word of mouth, accounting for at least some of these strange transformations, but the metamorphic nature of demonic names is especially fascinating. I struggled with it myself while writing this book.
<laughs> uh, if you like it, if you end up buying it and you and you like it, please reshare and leave a review. It's the only means of showing the world that this book even exists. The about the author will profess, I am the underdog, a secret weapon. So we are carrying this book upon our backs. Some of you are here for the events that transpired leading up to its sudden publication. Purchasing this book is the perfect way to show that you support genuine hard work and quality content, as opposed to everything that's wrong with the quote publications, as pollute our community with fast and easy reprints lacking spirit or research. The back of the book mentions, while the art may leave something to be desired, having been created in a state of emergency, you will find that the information contained inside Armada's Book of Beelzebub is up to par with the excellence that you will soon come to expect. Surely, the distribution of the earliest edition was a heroic act. So, how does purchasing this book make a tangible statement in support of hard work and quality content? How does it oppose the charlatans and mindless echo chambers, landing a blow that counts? From the prologue, an explanation of the circumstances expounds. I was originally writing this book with Arundo Brock Overman. It was meant to be combined with parts that Overman had written and would have been longer. I was advised against combining my writings with Overman by a successful grimoire author. He told me he is more well known, but he is not respected in the serious grimoire community. He is seen as a noob's author. Looking at your work, you could be taken seriously in a way that he is not. The way you are approaching the material and presenting it is really good. If you are going to continue writing, I would recommend writing your next book solo. He is churning out books, but the content is not new material. Your writing is lucid and concise. His style is commonly described as cut and paste. Well, go figure. I defended piggybacking on Arundo because he is well known and I am not. He has an art team and I do not. Naturally, this blew up in my face. It did not escape me that I was doing more extensive and in-depth research than Overman had ever demonstrated in any of his books. I did not need another to point that out. Although, as the dedication goes, we want to be seen and recognized by those who know how. I was aware of the trade-off, yet I had accepted it. I am a thorough individual, meticulous and careful. I will always hold myself and anything that I produce to a higher standard, but Arundo has his own fan base, which he brought to the table. Not to mention his enthusiastic and regular self-promotions. Surely I would have sold more copies at his side. Never would I be here, boasting of my superior efforts, if our arrangement had been carried through to completion. Regardless of my feelings, I would have sat back and allowed the work to speak for itself, because that's the class he wrote. However, Arundo chose to abruptly cut me out of the book during the final week of writing. The prologue continues, this from the cut and paste warrior I was warned about when I had sent him my latest draft the night before. He also preemptively blocked me from every Facebook group for which he had a position on the moderation team, effectively silencing and isolating me, including groups where I had been a moderator myself, including groups which he did not run, for which he therefore did not have the authority to make such a decision without so much as attempting to seek out permission from the rest of administration. He may cite that I was taking too long, but this was dishonest and cheap. I am absolutely making accusations when I say this. I believed that Overman and I were in this together, so I routinely updated him over messages whenever I uncovered new, exciting, and never before published information that I would be investing into our book, especially when I could prove that others had published inaccuracies or else partial accounts and my version would serve as a revision or a more complete picture. He had access to my tireless investigations, and almost all of their born through. How does one protect a claim to ideas, to intangible innovations of an academic nature? Overman's books to date have consistently been cut and paste. Please don't let him bypass copyright technicalities by simply retracing my steps and writing again what I had already written. Furthermore, be aware that I have, I have an extremely restricted platform for self-advertising, partially due to his blocking me from so many of my home groups. I was, I was, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm meant for writing, I'm not meant for talking out loud. <laughs> but okay, so I was brought back in one such group, kindly cross-checked the manifest in demonology worldwide. It corroborates that I have been a moderator of demonolatry worldwide since June 1st, 2022. And the section for the group badges, the two uppermost badges are moderator and new member. Yeah, that's because after he blocked me from the group, that ban had to be lifted and my accolades restored. But that was only one group. Overman has consciously inserted himself into the mod squad for several. He's a popular guy. I am just one solitary and isolated person. You crying an influential and popular guy. He struck me from each of these groups in one single session before I'd even woken up to his messages. And behold, that I could not respond because he blocked me. For this reason, if you wish to raise a flag to support hard work and quality content, please reshare the link to my book. The truth is out there and eventually it will become known. I won't tolerate those who try to undermine the injustice that was committed against me or who try to simmer me down. That tells me you've never put together a string of thoughts that were worth protecting as your own. 
If you have ever strained yourself, pouring actual soul into your scholarly endeavors, as to have pioneered material that endowed you with well-earned pride, if you have deliberately kept your promising breakthroughs and progress on a project out of the public eye, so as to prepare for an explosive premiere, perhaps you will understand the danger I had to head off. In so doing, I have successfully proven that this is my intellectual property, that whatever of it has not been published elsewhere is mine, whether it be an original idea, for example. Um, okay, so there is, I had a theory um, on the confusion surrounding the poorly worded directives for the formation of the lawmen and how they don't align across manuscripts. This is something that I shared with Joseph H. Peterson, um, who he's published his own version of the Grimorian Virum. He published the Book of Oberon. He's published numerous works. Um, but so I shared this with Joseph H. Peterson in our private conversations. For starters, I confirmed with Peterson that the fabled missing lawmen from so many grimoires could be found impounded in the Archivio di Stato. But Peterson already figured this. As we talked, he told me he'd been wanting to revisit some of the subjects of which we discussed, but had not had yet had the time. I noted that there was a discrepancy in the virum per the lawmen, but even more stark than this was the exact and direct contradiction between the Lansdowne manuscripts and the secrets of Solomon. Uh, at first, Peterson didn't know what to say. When he got back to me, he framed his words. I believe the original text said that women should prepare it on the day and hour of Mars. It doesn't specify any particular day for men for whatever reason, but I had grounds to suspect a reason. Um, but so Armada's book of Beelzebub compares each, and these are some of the passages. These are quotes from the book. The Secrets of Solomon recommends for a woman to use blood and do it on the day of Mars, but gives no day for the male. So, and then in the Lansdowne manuscripts, however, a, a man must create the lawman on the day of Mars, and that a female has to do it on any other day. As promised, there is an exact, that's an exact contradiction. There is a reoccurring issue with these specifications, and my book resumes. The Virum says that if you are a female or male, to write the characters in blood or engrave the characters on the day and hour of Mars. So what does it mean? Peterson and I both believe that the line, a female is to do it any, on any other day, uh, was added to the Lansdowne man manuscripts at a later date. But the following is 100% mine. So it is my belief that the original text may have meant for a woman to use blood on the day of Mars, but gives no day for a male because they were both supposed to do it on the day of Mars. The sentence was ill-conceived, but attempted to convey between the options of engraving or blood painting a woman should use blood, and a man could engrave. For either a man or a woman, it had to be on the day of Mars. Armada's Book of Beelzebub declares, Bloodstone is often martial. The day and hour of Mars makes sense for either. The statement was probably that women should use blood, whereas men could use blood or engrave. But both should be done on the day of Mars, which is every Tuesday. So whether it was one of like my ideas, or whether it came from my research that a discovery was made, it's still mine and I deserve the credit. The prologue nears its conclusion, wrapping up as I confessed, I feel pressed to publish what I have. Indeed, I published this book within three days of the Arundel scandal, still within the projected timeline which I had communicated to him before the block. It was sooner even that the writing therein was completed, exactly as it stands and can be read from the moment of release. I had intended this first edition to act as evidence, and so it has. Not only did I finish with the draft, I also swiftly went forward with it. Arundel had expected the final touches to take at least another month following my submission. No one meant for it to be ready as it was. I didn't have an editor, an art team. I didn't have anyone whatsoever, but I drew the damn diagrams myself. I ingested the entirety of it to be presented as independent, meaning that I focused on aspects of appearance, changing the whole layout, formatting, uh, heating the line spacing, creating a table of contents, promotional details, cover and synopsis, add-ons such as a prologue, afterward about the author, etc., uh, rather than being able to hone in on what I would have otherwise, that is the writing, the open queries I would have liked to resolve, but having been disillusioned wholly over the overman. I made a decision in these critical hours. I decided that some things should never have been rushed because you don't rush greatness. So I sent my baby out into the world to you, my readers, and my witnesses. As quoted from the promotional information, this earliest edition could become rare. It is likely that this edition would, will soon be replaced given the want for more professional artwork and with ample opportunity now that there is no hurry, luxurious though unnecessary illustrations lifted from the manuscripts themselves further fatten it. But this edition, this first edition, represents something. It was my refusal to be exploited, and I welcome you graciously to be a part of that, because your support matters. As stated, this first edition will very likely become rare in due time. I felt like a champion when I put it out there, and it has its own heroic little background. I also want to share an odds and phenosity, a coincidence if you still believe in those. It's not about the book, at least not about this book. On June 3rd, three years past, I dreamed that I stood in a garden with others. If I'm not mistaken, earlier in the dream, we had sowed the, the seeds for this very garden. We planted it, but now everything was alive, far beyond mere sprouting buds. The trees and the growths were tall and strong and old. We stood in a circle holding hands. One tree in the garden was glowing blue. I remember watching it sway in the wind. 
and someone asked me if I would be willing to write The Devil's Codex. I was asked to write a book, and I was told that it would be The Devil's Codex. For whatever reason, my dream mind, with her dream logic, accepted the task of writing this book, yet rejected calling it The Devil's Codex. I cannot fathom why. Conscious me would have been honored, delighted at such a request, and at such a name, but the psychonaut would not comply. So I gave it a working title instead, quoted from the original dream log. Now, I don't even remember what that title was, but the fact that it was a working title meant that there was no final say. It meant that the book never had a true name. I had to refer to it by something so as to refer to it at all. Therefore, I loosely addressed it as something, something which I cannot remember. I expect the reason that I would not simply accept The Devil's Codex, even as its working title, relates to how weirdly defiant I can be in my dreams. There's a good chance I rejected it on principle, to the tune of, no, I won't do as I'm told. Childish, but I can't always help who and what I am in the astral space. Someone in the dream handed me a large envelope, and herein was this book. Uh, it was their codex. The envelope was covered in numbers like random sequences. Given the circumstances surrounding the sudden publication of Armada's Book of Beelzebub, you can be certain that the date of its release was not planned in order to coincide with the date of my codex dream, or any other dates for that matter. This was not done on purpose. I didn't realize until moments before that I was publishing my Book of Beelzebub on June 3rd, and that my codex dream was also logged June 3rd, three years to the day. The book I happened to publish on the same day is about Beelzebub. I was never told what goes inside the Devil's Codex, although I'd love to speculate. For years I have wondered. It is amazing that it came to pass on the same day. Yeah, so I'm just gonna end the thing there. So I know a secret though. Arundo's done this before. I was an Overman's first victim, but I'll be his loudest. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I guess, yeah, so this is the book. Armada's Book of Beelzebub, an occult history of Beelzebub. It's beautiful. Look, my boyfriend drew this picture. Hang on. I'm probably going to have him, like, redraw all the art. Because I... <laughs> but here, my boyfriend drew this one. Thank you, guys, for your support.